Welcome to... Welcome to the Rotary Club of Tulsa. My name is Rhonda Daniel, your club president, and we are so glad that you were with us today. Let's begin by having our volunteers come to the stage. We're going to have Becky Fields lead off our invocation, Song and Pledge by Lori Nadd. On the piano is Tom Wolf. Visitor introduction by past president Steve Clark. Becky? Thank you, President Rhonda. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather here today, we are aware of and thankful for the many blessings we have in our life. We are grateful for this opportunity to serve our communities through our work and contributions. Ignite in us a passion to help those in need. Stir up the gifts in us that will make an impact on this city and the world. Make us sensitive to opportunities where we can give. Help us to be the hands and feet that carry out the very important work that needs to be done. And help us all to have the desire to leave each person we meet with an impression of increase in their lives. We thank you for your grace and mercy toward us. Help us extend that to others today in the same measure that you give to us. In your name we pray, amen. Hello, uh, help me sing God Bless America and then the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome everyone to the Rotary Club of Tulsa. You're attending club number 2500. As I call the names of our guests today, if you would Please stand briefly as I call your name along with your Rotary host and we will recognize you after all have been introduced. Brian Driscoll is the guest of Tim Caldwell. Dana Simon is the wife of Norman Simon. Linda Galbraith and Frank Malhern are both from the Gilcrease Museum are in guests of Beverly Marquardt. Mark Morley is the guest of Jerry Dillon. District Attorney Steve Kunzweiler is the guest of John McGrath. Anna Heidenyak is our foreign exchange student from Austria and is the guest of Karen Keith. Steve Emery is the guest of Diane Peacock. Jack Buckley is the guest of Lauren Monet. Brian Talkington from American Heritage Bank is the guest of John Raines. Pat Lycom is the guest of Kip Lycom. Kevin Buck from the University of Tulsa is the guest of Susan Meeker, as is Clark Buck, who is a visiting Rotarian from Ohio. Would you please welcome all these guests, please? <laughs> Rotarians from other clubs visiting today are Jack Maxwell from the Bixby Club and Lynn Festerman from the Southside Club. Thanks to all of you for making Rotary a part of your day, and please come back anytime. Thank you, volunteers. I want to recognize this week's Rotary sponsors and thank them for supporting our club activities. Brenda Melancon with McGraw Realtors, Rob Robards with Southern Hills Vet, Elaine Dishman, also known as Dish, with Regents Bank, Trudy Sweeten with Bank of o uh, BOK Center. We encourage you to do business with your fellow Rotarians. Now let's take a moment and let's thank the volunteers who came early to make this meeting run smoothly. <laughs> Have a special treat for you today. 
Past President Jimmy Sade conducted Stars and Stripes Forever, our national march, during the 2004 IBA Awards. Please enjoy this look back featuring past President Jimmy Sade, for whom today's award recognition was named. In Rotary, we have the motto, Service Above Self. It became obvious in 1977 that the innovative, sometimes quiet, but always effective hard work of certain Rotarians inspired us all to work harder. So our club came up with our own recognition award to give to those Rotarians whose service above self goes beyond even Rotary's high standards. We called our award the Service Above Self and then some award. It is our most prestigious award. The award is always based on a body of work, unselfish acts to the service to the club that gives the six avenues of service a deeper meaning. Any member may submit a nomination to the Long Range Planning Committee who in turn recommends the individual to the Board of Directors for recognition. In 36 years, the award has been presented just 18 times. Those 18 individuals are listed on the cards on your tables and are described in the Club Centennial book. Nine of these past recipients are alive today and seven of those nine are present at today's meeting. Please listen as I highlight each recipient's service to Rotary and hold your applause until all have been introduced. To understand the meaning of this award and continue the heritage associated one honoree that is no longer with us must be mentioned, and you just saw him on the video. James G. Sade. 
After joining the Rotary Club of Tulsa, Jimmy was to become a legendary Rotarian. <clears throat> he served as president in 76, 77. He founded and directed the Rotary Men of Note and launched our first camp enterprise. A portrait of John Philip Sousa, Jimmy performed the Sousa style concert that filled ORU's Maybe Center with all proceeds going to the Rotary Club of Tulsa Foundation. He chaired the club's 75th anniversary celebration and served as Rotary mentor to many in the club and the district. Jimmy shepherded the organization and charter of the Rotary Club of Owasso. In 1981, Jimmy was named District 6110 Rotarian of the Year. In 2005, the club recognition was renamed James G. Sade, Service Above Self, and then some. Award in his memory. He was the father of Rotarian Bob Sade, club president, 2001-2. Now to those who continue to model all that that represents, please stand as I call your name and stay standing as I list your accomplishments. Jerry L. Cornelius, the inaugural recipient of the award, Jerry was recognized for outstanding service as a club officer, board member, chair of multiple committees, and club photographer. For more than a decade, Jerry served as the club roster and gasser editor when the club publication was both a weekly newsletter and a monthly magazine. The book celebrating the club's centennial, Celebrate 100 Years of Rotary and Service, was Jerry's vision to help recognize the club's centennial and to contribute to the permanent historical archives of the club. Thank you, Jerry. Alan J. Edwards, Jr., president of the club in 72-73. Alan provided leadership for many Rotary projects. He is the founder of the Rotary Club of Tulsa Foundation, which has raised more than three million and provided more than one million in grants to local charities since its inception in 1972. In 2011, Alan became the first to designate 25,000 from his estate to be given to the foundation. The Alan Edwards Society of the Foundation recognizes those who have included Tulsa Rotary in their estate planning. Robert D. Linacher, another legendary Rotarian. Bob served as club president in 7980 and chaired numerous committees and projects, a skilled fundraiser. He created the Henry P. Iba Citizens Athlete Awards, considered to be the club's signature event to replace various club fundraisers. Years later, Bob co-chaired the club's official centennial project, the creation of the Rotary Plaza on the Williams Green. The $1 million project Bob raised, that makes the largest project undertaken by Rotary in the first 100 years of the club. Thank you, Bob. Harold W. Calhoun, Dr. Hal Calhoun, served as the club's 86-87 president. Gargarius Rotarian, Hal expressed irritation when he spoke about the state of underfunded, poor performing Oklahoma schools. In a passionate speech before the club in 89, Hal challenged the membership, look beyond itself and actively tackle the issues facing public education. That year, under Hal's leadership, Rotary adopted Celia Clinton Elementary, an at-risk school located on North Harvard. The partner school relationship engaged dozens of Rotarians and transformed the club's community service outreach. Rotary poured financial resources into the school's improvements, and over the years, Rotarians have served as mentors and volunteers at the school. Jack Maxwell. Jack was awarded the club's highest honor for its efforts to foster the vision of Rotary through membership development, serving as counsel to many clubs in the district, and his greatest achievement, founding the Medical Supplies Network, also known as MSNI, was started as an international project of the club, but grew to become Tulsa-based District 6110 Outreach. Since its creation, MSNI has shipped more than 200 containers of surplus medical equipment and supplies to 36 countries. Jack left the club in 2000 after organizing the Rotary Club of Bixby. Thank you, Jack. Jean T. Martin. Jean, who served as club president in 92-93, accepted the challenge of chairing the steering committee that hosted the 2005 Rotary Large Club Conference in Tulsa. More than a year went into the effort and brought together the 
30, 33 largest clubs west of the Mississippi. By day, the visiting president-elect and executive directors learned the intricacies of running large rotary clubs, and at night, they were hosted at Southern Hills, the Will Rogers Memorial, and many individual Rotarian homes. Gene's organization and the quality of the conference left such a lasting impression when another city withdrew its invitation to hold the large club conference in 2012, Tulsa offered to host both the East and the West, over 60 clubs was accepted. Thank you, Jean. Robert Vassar. Bob's service to the club went well beyond his year as president in 79 and 80. In the early years before personal computer became a commonplace, Bob formed the Rotary Computer Club. The group met regularly as Bob taught Rotarians the basics of PCs, emailing, and exploring a phenomenon called the internet. Additionally, Bob served as advisor to many club presidents and continues to chair the club's annual elections of officers and directors. Thank you, Bob. Mr. Ron Butler. Service above self does not adequately describe the commitment of this Rotarian. Ron, who is an award-winning graphic designer and co-owner of a marketing communication firm, has donated thousands of hours designing club brochures, signs, banners, logos, awards, and graphics. His leadership, passion, and tireless creative design efforts helped to ensure the success of the Henry P. Iva Citizens Athlete Awards since its inception. He served as club officer, director, and multiple times. Ron also designed the club identity graphics of the Centennial logo as well as the club's Centennial book, Celebrate 100 Years of Rotary in Service. Thank you, Ron. Tim Colwell, also known as Timothy. <laughs> During his year as club president, 2007 and 8, Tim created the Above and Beyond Awards, the annual event recognizing Tulsa's Police Officer and Firefighter of the Year for co-chairing the club's official centennial project, the funding and installation of Rotary Plaza on Williams Center Green. He was honored with Leadership Tulsa's Paragon Award in 2013. He served as editor of the club's 75th anniversary publication, Tulsa Rotary 75, and is co-author of the club's centennial book, again, Celebrate 100 Years in Rotary of Rotary in Tulsa. He also co-chaired the club's year-long centennial observation. For the first time during Tim's presidential year, the club's membership topped 500. These Rotarians prove that an individual can make a significant difference in our community and our world. Please thank them personally when you get a chance, and now help me recognize them by a standing ovation, everyone. I need a drink. <laughs> All right. Let's please remember the service for Carl Wright that takes place this Friday at 2 p.m. at the Ninth Memorial Chapel. And also, uh, it has been our tradition for many years, we, we will once again enjoy Steak Day on June 24th. So we need to make sure that all the Rotarians and their guests have enough steak, so please be sure to sign up. And I'm looking for an announcement because I missed one, so give me one second. Okay, word reached us this week that Paul Johnson fell a few weeks ago. He is out of the hospital and progressing uh, rapid in rehab. Please use the cards on your tables to extend well wishes to Paul. Committee meetings today is IBA Wards Room 232. Budget, room 233. Classifications, room 234. New member orientation, the Beacon Room. Centennial Committee, adult classroom 207. I have a steering committee, adult classroom 209. You know what that means? It means that things are gearing up for the next year. You know what that means? Two more weeks. <laughs> All right, now, Bob said, please make your way to this stage to introduce our newest member, but some of you may know him. And Jake Dollarhide, thank you for doing the orientation. Mr. Said. It's always nice to invite our alumni back to the club. As you probably know, Vic Bailey was a member of this club for 10 years. At that time, he was very active in the club, uh, became a community fellow, was on the IBA committee, did several different things. But he took a job in Muskogee, and for four years, he was in the Muskogee Club. Um, 
while there. I understand he was their program chairman, which I can't believe they let you do that. Suck that out. So talked into that. Uh, now he's back uh, working at Channel 8 here in Tulsa. His classification is electronic, electronic media sales. He's been married to his lovely wife, Susie, for 48 years, have two grown children, two grandkids, and if you know anything about Vic, you know he is a proud TU alum. <clears throat> Vic, I've, uh, <laughs> I've lobbied for years that we could give our new members a box of Krispy Kreme donuts, but I keep getting voted down, so <laughs> instead we will add to your collection, here is your third rotary pin and your third four-way test. <laughs> Welcome back to Rotary. <laughs> and now, our Sergeant in Arms, Mr. Matthew Bristow. Two more weeks. Two, two more, more weeks. weeks. All right, who's counting? So, a reminder for everyone who, who's uh, new to the club today, all the fines announced go to the uh, local foundation that we have, and these are various causes that we support. Onto our slides. So, Marlene Liverdace uh, is celebrating in a couple of days two years in Rotary, and she gave $75 for Camp Enterprise. So, thank you, Marlene. <laughs> now, Mr. Buck may not be aware, but uh, Susan approached me yesterday to uh, honor her father in law to be, who is a Rotarian from Ohio, visiting us today. So welcome, Clark, and uh, please know that we're gonna get a flag from the Rotary office that we can exchange through the mail with a flag from Ohio. So thank you and welcome today. <laughs> Bob Lundgren, um, birthday on June 12th, couple of days. That was difficult to pronounce. I should have practiced that one. Um, Bob, I'll just say Bob. Uh, $100 from Bob and happy birthday, so thank you very much. It's always fun when uh, Rotarian's been generous recently, but then you let them know that it's a really big anniversary, so they may want to uh, recognize this one as well. And Harvey kindly stepped up 20 years in Rotary for Harvey, and he gave another $100 for Camp Enterprise. So thank you very much. <laughs> Apparently June 12th is a very good day for birthdays. Um, Ken uh, sent a note through saying that he wanted to make a $200 uh, donation for Crescendo, one of the many excellent outreach programs of this great club. So thank you very much, Ken, and happy birthday. <laughs> and Beverly, who has some guests with us today, she's celebrating three years, or she did celebrate three years in Rotary on June 27th, and uh, came up to me last week and asked which uh, of the programs that we support she hadn't yet supported. We figured out it was Camp Enterprise, so that was another 100 bucks for that. 50 bucks for each year, 250. Thank you very much, Beverly. <laughs> there are still two more chances if you have not yet been up this year. Uh, here's my contact information and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> now, Timothy has an announcement for us. Okay, I think uh, there's a little bit of uh, overexposure by some of, uh, some of us up here in front. And I have to say thank you for that wonderful introduction, but when you have to ask people to give you a standing ovation, <laughs> it, it lacks just a little something, President Rhonda, but thank you anyway, and thank you, Rotarians. Sorry. Well, uh, we are so excited. Okay. <laughs> They're here. <laughs> after after uh, two and a half years, uh, Jerry Cornelius and I are so thrilled that the books have arrived. All the, all the pages are in, in place. We haven't really found any more typos, but we're not really looking all that carefully right now. <laughs> but next week and the week after, we're going to be distributing these, um, these books to those of you who attended the gala. Those books are free. Uh, those who did not attend, or if you'd like to purchase an additional book, they're $50. And that's a greatly reduced uh, uh, price, but we want every member of the club to have one. We're so proud of that. And as an added bonus, um, this is what uh, Joni Stevenson and our wonderful Centennial Committee are going to be doing afterwards. In each book, you'll see 
there is a copy of the Jack Frank video that, that premiered that night. That will be a part of the book that you're going to be picking up next week. So um, that's next week. Now, today and um, today and today only. No, today and next week also. Um, the spirit polls that Sharon King Davis have has donated to Rotary. All dollars uh, will be going to the to the foundation and to help us with final. Um, uh, uh, expenses from Rotary. So these are being sold for $50 um, and Joni said this would make a great thing for your patio. And so she's got this out on the patio. So um, this is kind of a reflection of uh, Ron Butler's wonderful Centennial logo. And so this is our one last memento of that. And also many of you have asked for a video of that incredible gala um, with, with our past president, Wilf Wilkinson, the governor, uh, Jana Jay, the queen of country fiddle. That is uh, also on sale jo at Joni's table out there. She'll be uh, selling the spirit pools and the, the, uh, the gala video for $20. So thank you so much. Thank you for all your support for all of the Centennial over the last gosh, six years as we started working on the Centennial Plaza as well. But um, it's all coming to an end as we wrap up this Rotary year. Next week, come to pick up your books. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Tom. <laughs> yeah, here we go. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Congrats, Tim. <laughs> this is out of order. I know. It must be two weeks ago. I know. But 12 days to IBA. 12 days to IBA. Tell us about it. We haven't heard anything about yes. it. I've got an update. Coach Sutton is going to be there. He's feeling oh, better. Oh, good. Uh, he said he wouldn't miss it, and he challenges all of you to be there. Um, if we have the slide on the screen, maybe... This is, uh, thanks to Force Cameron, this is the GTR uh, newspaper's article about the Ivo Awards, has our all-star lineup. So our male honoree is Denver Broncos cornerback, all-pro Chris Harris. Female honoree is our world record mountain climber, Melissa Arnott. Uh, Barry Henson is our keynote. Seth is back, Seth Davis back is our MC. To kick it off though, a Rotarian Phil Armstrong is going to sing the national anthem mm. a cappella. Oh, that nice. alone is worth the price of a ticket. Support our foundation. Get your tickets in the lobby. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Now our Rotarian of the day, David Downing. David is the owner of Acrobat Ant. He is a Club Foundation fellow and has been a member since June 2008. Rotarian of the Day, Mr. David Downing. Thank you, President Rhonda. You know, if you ask anybody in this town to give an elevator speech about Tulsa, in the first sentence, you're going to hear something about Gilcrease Museum, and it's the, that it's the country's premier facility uh, for the preservation and study of American art and history, and it's the home to the world's largest, most comprehensive collection of art and artifacts in the American West. That is certainly a shining star for this city, and we're honored today to have James Pepper Henry with us, the executive director of the Gilcrease Museum. Jim came to the Gilcrease from the Heard Museum in Phoenix, where he was the director and chief executive. Prior to that, Jim uh, had a six-year tenure and, in Alaska at the Anchorage Museum. Uh, where he uh, was over the Alaska's premier art, history, and science, institu excuse me, and science institution there in Alaska. He's also the former associate director of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., and he also played a pivotal role uh, in the establishment of that organization. There he managed a wide variety of American Indian community-oriented programs, services, and traveling exhibitions. Closer to home, Jim has served as the founding director of the Kanza Museum in Cost City, Oklahoma. He's the curator, or had curator and director roles at the Portland Art Museum, the Interstate Firehouse Cultural Center in Portland, Oregon, and the Institute of Alaska Native Arts in Fairbanks, Alaska. In addition to that, if that really wasn't enough, uh, Jim is the co-founder and the president of the Kanza Iloshka Society, 
which is dedicated to the uh, perpetuation of the cultural lifeways and traditions of the Kaw people. He's a graduate of the University of Oregon. He's a recipient of that university's prestigious Council for Minority Education Leadership Award. He's a graduate also of the Museum Leadership Institute at the Getty Center in Los Angeles. He is a Rotarian. He is a Paul Harris Fellow, and rumor has it that he's going to soon be a member of our club. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. James Pepper Henry. Well, it's my pleasure and honor to be here today, uh, not just as a new Tulsan, but uh, also as a Rotarian. And uh, this is my first public gig since uh, I arrived two months ago at the Gilcrease Museum. And uh, just so you know, uh, I, my family's been in Oklahoma for five generations. And my family comes from the Kaw City area, which is uh, underwater, uh, is my understanding these days. I saw some pictures yesterday. Uh, my, my grandmother's from Broken Arrow, my grandfather's from uh, a town called Washunga, which is now under Kaw Lake, and they moved that town up to uh, Kaw City. And uh, I lived for a while in Oklahoma. I worked for the Kaw Nation of Oklahoma. I'm a member of the Kaw Nation uh, here, and uh, helped found, as, as we heard, I uh, helped found our tribe's tribal museum there. And I left 20 years ago to go to the Smithsonian Institution, so it's taken me 20 years to come back to Oklahoma, but I'm very, very excited to be here. I have relatives all over the state, lots of relatives here in Tulsa. Uh, one of my cousins is, uh, her name is Jackie Hensley. She was the special assistant to Governor Fallon on Indian Affairs, and she's now here in Tulsa, works for the Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, so I could, I could go down the list, Scheidler, Newkirk, Blackwell, Owasso, uh, Sepulpa here in Tulsa, and even a few relatives down in Oklahoma City. So I feel like an Oklahoman, even though I wasn't born here, I was born in Portland, Oregon, but I've been coming to Oklahoma just about every year for, the, for my entire life, and I don't, I don't want to tell you how old I am, but let's just say it's almost half a century, let's put it that way. Um, I want to go through a few slides with you today. It is my great honor and pleasure to be the next executive director of your museum, the Gilcrease Museum. And of course, the Gilcrease is one of the finest museums in the country. And it is one of the best kept secrets in the country too. And we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about that today, how we're gonna let the rest of the world know about the Gilcrease Museum. Uh, I happen to be also of Muskogee Creek descent and the founder of the Gilcrease, Gilcrease Museum, Thomas Gilcrease, is also Muskogee Creek, so that's also an honor for me to follow in his footsteps. But before I get into the Gilcrease, I want to talk a little bit about uh, where I've been because I've picked up a, a few things along the way in my journey coming back to Oklahoma. Uh, just before arriving here, I was the uh, executive director of the Heard Museum in Phoenix, Arizona. And the Heard Museum, if you haven't been there, is probably, uh, arguably, the finest American Indian art museum in the country. Um, certainly have the best collection of Southwest native art, but uh, it's a beautiful building, beautiful facility, uh, right in the heart of Phoenix, and it is completely privately owned. And uh, having, you know, being a private museum has its challenges, and here, here's an aerial view of, of the Herd Museum, but there are some great things going for the Herd. One is um, they have the second largest native market in the country. How many of you have been to Santa Fe, to the uh, Indian art market in Santa Fe? It's, well, if you've ever been there, I'd say a, a quarter of the artists that are in that market are from Oklahoma. A lot of great native artists. And same with the uh, Herd Indian Fair and Market in Phoenix. A good percentage of folks are from Oklahoma. And we do have our Indian arts uh, fairs and festivals here. I think Red Earth uh, is going on and um, We've got the Cherokee art market and other things that happen here, but nothing at the scale or the, the quality of, of Santa Fe and what the herd does. And the market is only for two days. It's in the beginning of March. But in two days, we generated $16 million in sales. And people from all over the world come to Phoenix for this market. And so as we talk about the Gilcrease, we'll talk about some opportunities there as well. Uh, now, Phoenix, how many of you have been to Phoenix in the summertime? How many of you wished you hadn't been in Phoenix in the summertime? Well, 
Right now it's 100 and plus degrees uh, in Phoenix, and Phoenix is not a place you want to be in the summertime. And so visitorship at the Heard Museum dropped significantly, and we wanted to turn that around. We, were, we thought of ways to make the, the off-season the on-season, and so we decided to come up with more family-friendly activities to bring kids that are out of school to the Heard Museum, uh, parents and grandparents looking for things for their kids and grandkids to do. And uh, a few years ago, we came up with the idea of uh, looking at something that's ubiquitous, something that's popular to introduce people to things that aren't as familiar. So we, we looked at Lego building blocks and put together an exhibit called Build. And we, we invited native artists and Latino artists to come in and develop traditional designs made out of Lego building blocks. And uh, it, was, it was fantastic. We, we had, you know, uh, Navajo, this is a Navajo rug that was um, made out of Lego building blocks. And you can see uh, those are angry birds <laughs> that were in the original design, well, uh, built with Lego building blocks. And this, these two gentlemen, uh, one's a reporter, and the other gentleman here is from a local Lego users uh, group. And I had no idea there, there were adult user groups that sit around and play with Legos all day long. And, but they were very supportive. In fact, that group built a scale model of the Herd Museum. I don't have a picture of it, but a scale model of the Herd Museum made out of Legos, and they donated it to the museum. So, um, so what we found with the Lego exhibit, that if you offer something that is going to attract people, they'll come. And we increased membership for that time period between uh, June and August 250%. Uh, we also uh, increased visitorship by over 100% uh, for that time period. And I know the, the Oak Crease also has seasonal visitors, so thinking about how we can get more visitors out to the Oak Crease Museum. Uh, another incredible thing about the Herd Museum is its gift shop. And I don't know if you've ever been there uh, into the gift shop, but we have, or the Herd Museum had one of the most uh, successful gift shops in the country, uh, $5.5 million in sales each year just in the gift shop. And that contributed 65% of the operational costs for the Herd Museum. And what makes it special is that everything in the shop is one of a kind, handmade, native made for the most part. Um, and you can only find this selection at the Herd Museum. But of course, and see the wonderful bolo tie that I'm wearing today, that comes from the Herd Museum shop. And so we're thinking about ways to uh, increase our inventory and the quality of our inventory at the Gilcrease Museum and make it a destination in and of itself. And people come from all over the world just to go to the Heard Museum gift shop because of the uniqueness of it. And we have so many wonderful artists right here in Oklahoma that I think the shop could, could really uh, have an impact in our community. On to the next one. Before I was at the Heard, I was at the Anchorage Museum in Anchorage, Alaska. And, and when I left the Smithsonian to go to Alaska, and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the Anchorage Museum. They thought I was going to be in some little log cabin building on the side of the highway on the way to Mount McKinley. And, but little do, do people know that the Anchorage Museum is one of the largest, or is the largest museum in Alaska and one of the largest museums in the north. And uh, I arrived just at a time when we were mounting a $110 million expansion capital campaign. And you can see this, this glass area right here is the result over our campaign, we added 80,000 square feet. If you see over here on the side, that's the old museum. It was a brick building. It was about 90,000 square feet. And it was uh, pointed, it, uh, downtown is, is uh, the museum now faces downtown, but right here, um, the front entrance was right across the street from the federal courthouse. So it wasn't very uh, welcoming um, uh, into the museum. And so when we thought about how we could transform the museum, not only adding space and maybe reconfiguring space, but the, the entryway to the museum, how it, it will impact the visitor experience. And so we moved the entrance from that, from that side street so it faced downtown, so it opens up to downtown Anchorage. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we did here in the interior when I talk about the Gilcrease Museum, but, uh, but changing some of the internal space and the visitor experience, we went from 90,000 visitors a year, which is a lot. And we have a lot of tourists that uh, come up to Alaska to 250,000 visitors a year. And a lot of that not only had to do with the reconfiguration of the space, making a public space 
as part of the museum, but also um, uh, bringing the cafe up front to the museum, having a large gathering space in the lobby area, bringing our resource center and the gift shop all into one place before you even buy a ticket to get into the museum. And of course, we added uh, a large enough exhibition space to bring in some of the best traveling exhibits in the world. And um, Anchorage is just the opposite of Phoenix. You don't want to be there in the wintertime. And most people go to Phoenix in the wintertime, I think from Alaska. So, uh, but we, we added a large changing gallery space and we were able to bring in exhibits that uh, normally the museum wouldn't, wouldn't go after, but uh, knowing the local community and the fact that people wanted to be inside and we weren't getting a lot of tourists, we switched from being an Alaska-themed museum in the summer for the tourists to switching that around and focusing on some of the great traveling exhibits that people would have to go to Chicago or San Francisco or New York to see. And we started out with a couple of exhibits. One was Star Wars Where Science Meets Imagination. And um, in this particular exhibit, um, it, was, uh, it was about a 12,000 square foot exhibit. We had a full scale model of the Millennium Falcon you could sit in and fly, but it was all, it was all based on science, how Star Wars influenced science and how science fiction influence real science. And uh, for a population of a town of only 300,000 people, we had 60,000 people come to this exhibit. So, you know, almost a third of the, uh, or, or a fourth of the population of Anchorage came to this exhibit. Uh, we also opened the new expansion with an exhibit called Gold. And this is from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. We, because we upgraded the facility, brought in the latest um, security technology, uh, motion sensors and so forth, we were able to bring this exhibit and we had over $250 million of gold in the building at the time the show was on. And we had 15,000 people come see the show on the first day. So it was pretty amazing how, how that really, bringing in the exciting traveling exhibits really changed the perception of the museum and our visitorship. And also the Anchorage Museum is home to the Smithsonian's Arctic Studies Center. We brought in some great technology and sort of like the Gilcrease, um, a, a lot of what the Anchorage Museum had was not on display, it's in the storage areas. And it's my understanding that three-tenths of one percent of what the Gilcrease has is ever on display. Uh, only about five percent of its art collection. And so thinking about the Gilcrease in the future, people want to see the stuff. They want to see the goods. And as we think about a new Gilcrease or redesigning the Gilcrease Museum, um, about getting more of the objects out on display, and this is an example of kind of a high-density display, and it's not uh, it, there's a lot of reflection in the glass on this picture, but it's not cluttered with a lot of label copy. And what we did was we brought in touchscreen technology so that if you wanted to get into the content of the uh, items, you, it's like a big iPhone. You can, you can tap into it and get, you can, you can see interviews with some of the native elders. You can see background information, catalog information, and historic photographs all on a touchscreen. And you can, it's even in high def, you can blow it up just like on an iPhone and, and see the detail of the objects. And so as we're thinking about the Gilcrease and the Kravis Discovery Center, uh, we're thinking about adding some of that technology. Uh, it was mentioned before, I spent 10 years of my life in Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. This is the largest museum dedicated to American Indians in the world. And I helped design this facility and open this facility. And uh, it was quite an experience for me. But the interesting thing is, in Washington, D.C., up until the time we built the National Museum of the American Indian, there was no monument, no national monument dedicated to the first peoples of this country. There was not one statue of an American Indian um, that was commissioned by any federal agency. There, there were some homages to native peoples throughout town, but, but nothing of national significance. And, uh, so it was, it was quite an honor to be involved in the development of the National Museum of the American Indian. Here, this was the only public sculpture that acknowledged Native Americans and it's Columbus conquering America with a native cowering at the feet of Columbus. And this was at uh, Union Square. So, um, but that's what I love about Oklahoma. 
and uh, Oklahoma does honor its native peoples. We have monuments all over the place. Um, we'll talk about sacred rain arrow in a minute, but um, here is the National Museum of the American Indian on the National Mall, and this was during opening day. You can see right here, this is part of a, a native procession that I helped organize. We had every federally recognized tribe in the United States and then First Nations in Canada and then indigenous peoples throughout Latin America participate in the opening of the National Museum of the American Indian. We had 600,000 people come that opening week um, for the opening. And uh, just an interesting fact, the first um, director of the National Museum of the American Indian is Rick West. He's from Muskogee, Oklahoma. Kevin Gover is now the director of the National Museum of the American Indian from Pawnee, Oklahoma. You've got Jim Pepper Henry, whoop, from a uh, uh, native from Oklahoma running the Gilcrease Museum. So Oklahoma is having an impact uh, all over the country with its museum directors. Patsy Phillips is also from Oklahoma. She's Choctaw. She's at the uh, uh, Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. Uh, Della Warrior is at, is at the Museum of uh, Indian Arts and Crafts in Santa Fe. So. Oklahoma has done well. I think I'm the first one to come back, though, to Oklahoma and, and work in a museum. But um, So Thomas Gilcrease. As I mentioned, Thomas Gilcrease um, is of Muscogee Creek descent and um, was fortunate enough to be allotted 160 acres back in the first part of the uh, 20th century and s discovered oil on his land. And that's where his wealth came from. And he took several trips to Europe as a young man, uh, got the collecting bug, and he got advice from, from one of his uh, rich oil colleagues, said, don't collect European art, you'll go bro broke pretty fast. You should concentrate on American art, and nobody's collecting American art, and that was at that period of time. So Thomas Gilcrease dedicated um, his life to amassing what is probably the most prestigious collection of American and Western art, and uh, also archives in the country, and the Gilcrease is uh, the only museum that has a certified copy of the Declaration of Independence. And uh, I was just talking to an insurance agent the other day, how do you insure a collection like the Gilcrease Museum's collection? And um, here's, the, here's the, uh, one of the entrances to the Gilcrease Museum. And we were trying to figure this out, and of course, I know one insurance company is going to insure the Gilcrease Museum for, for what it's worth, but I can tell you that the Gilcrease Museum is Tulsa's most valuable asset, more valuable than the airport, more valuable than just about all the other buildings put together. But we're, we're looking at north of $2 billion for the value of the collection of the Gilcrease Museum. But of course, it's priceless. You can't really put a price on the Gilcrease Museum. So with that, um, as I arrive here at the Gilcrease Museum, Thinking about the Gilcrease Museum, we have, we have great museums in Oklahoma. We have wonderful museums right here in Tulsa, including the Philbrook Museum. Um, of course, it doesn't have the collection like the Gilcrease Museum, but it's a, it's a fantastic museum. But thinking about, we've got this treasure. We've got this valuable asset, but it doesn't have a, a world-class venue anymore. And I think probably at the time when this was built back in the, in the late 1940s and then subsequent expansions, it probably was state of the art, you know, 50, 60 years ago. But now um, it's time to do something about the Gilcrease Museum. And, and I certainly didn't want to come back to Oklahoma and just sit on my hands and let time go by. I think we have a real opportunity with the Gilcrease Museum. It's a treasure of Tulsa. It's a treasure of Oklahoma. It's a national treasure. It's inter internationally known. Um, Every license plate in Oklahoma, or just about every license plate, has sacred rain arrow on it. That should be great advertising for the Gilcrease Museum, but it, I wish the license plate did say, at the Gilcrease Museum, <laughs> which would be great. Um, but anyway, but that just goes to you know, the prestige of the, of the Gilcrease Museum. I can't think of any other state that acknowledges um, art or museums the way we do here in Oklahoma. So here's an arrow shot of of the Gilcrease, and it's in a beautiful setting. And I think, is the technical name of where it's at, is it Skyline Ridge? Is that kind of, uh, somebody told me it's called Skyline Ridge up there. But anyway, kind of at the foothills of the Osage Hills. It's on 400 acres, and there's a lot of potential for the Gilcrease Museum. Um, you can see here, this is the front entrance right there, and that's the roundabout in front. There's Sacred Rain Arrow right there. So this last week, we went through 
um, a strategic planning exercise to talk about the Gilcrease and the challenges that it has. Uh, one of the new assets to the Gilcrease is the new Helmrich Center for American Research that just opened uh, a short time ago, and that's in collaboration with the University, University of Tulsa. And uh, many of you may know back in 2008, the city uh, of Tulsa, which owns the Gilcrease Museum, entered into a, a partnership with the University of Tulsa, and it's been fantastic. It's really changed uh, the flavor and the tone and tenor of the Gilcrease Museum. And it opened up its archives to researchers from around the world, and the Helmrich Center is a part of that now. And uh, we had a major symposium just a few months ago. Uh, of course, the Thomas Gilcrease House is there, and we're, we're thinking about what we do with, with the Thomas Gilcrease House. It's going to be rehabbed here in the next few months. Beautiful gardens, uh, lots of weddings at the Gilcrease Museum, but I think there's still a lot more potential. We do have a little bit of a footprint downtown at the Zero Center. It's not branded as the Gilcrease, but it is partially managed by the Gilcrease Museum and the University of Tulsa. It's right near the, uh, where the Philbrook Annex is in the Brady Arts District, and we're talking about what we can do with the Zero Center to increase our profile in downtown. And there are a lot of exciting things happening. Just a few weeks ago, the state legislature uh, passed uh, uh, a bond initiative to create the OK Pop Museum. I know that's been in the works for a while. That'll be in the Brady District. Uh, also, funding uh, was approved to build a, a Route 66 museum on 11th Street, close to downtown. And I really don't want the Gilcrease to get lost because all these things are happening downtown. And there's a perception out there, and I, I've been coming to the Gilcrease Museum my whole life, and there's a perception that it's out in the country or it's too far from downtown or it's you know it's not in a safe area or whatever whatever the excuses are but if you were standing in the Brady district it only takes you six minutes to get to the Gilcrease Museum it takes you twice as long to get to the Philbrook Museum and with all the lights that you have to go through to get to the to the Philbrook um, and it's a beautiful setting out there as well and we we do take the Gilcrease on the road this is Gilcrease on wheels uh, we go all over the state with educational programming. Uh, and this is kind of a pop-up exhibits for the Gilcrease on Wheels. And again, lots of, uh, we get lot, lots of school kids coming through the Gilcrease every year. We have programming for families on, on Sundays. But all of that is still not enough to get people to come to the Gilcrease Museum. And so uh, we've been thinking about this a little bit, thinking about its location. From the entrance of the Gilcrease Museum, there's a spectacular view of downtown Tulsa. And there's a few trees in the way, but, but it's a great view. And so we're thinking about how do we connect the Gilcrease with the rest of the downtown? I mean, it would be nice to airlift it up and bring it and plop it right downtown, but um, Thomas Gilcrease loved kind of being out outside of town a little bit. He chose this particular spot. He's laid to rest on this particular spot. And uh, so we're honoring that and, and looking at ways Again, uh, here you can see the uh, uh, Gilcrease, the 400 acres. It's this parcel here and this parcel over here and a little bit back in here. So there is a lot of potential to, ha to uh, take Stewart Park, which is the, the garden area behind the Gilcrease Museum, and expand that and have, uh, it's my understanding, there used to be lots of activities out in this 20-acre meadow. And, uh, and so we're thinking about how can we utilize the space better? How can we have more activities um, at, on the grounds of the Gilcrease Museum, how can we expand or should we expand the, the gardens? And one of the ideas that we have is, and here's, here's a little view of Stewart Park, it's a beautiful setting out there, most people don't know about, but is connecting the Gilcrease to the bike trails and what we're calling Gilcrease to the gathering place. And so you can see here's the existing bike trail along uh, the river and then having an offshoot up uh, Gilcrease Museum Road uh, and connecting this and then expanding the park too so that it's a destination for recreation, not just for museum goers. And there is a little bit of planning money right now, uh, close to a million dollars, I believe, to think about taking that Gilcrease Museum Road, widening it, um, making it more of an LA uh, with you know, maybe historic street lights and so forth, making it a, a, a nice drive up to the Gilcrease Museum with that bike path. And we've been working, oops, that's a little sideways there. I don't know what happened there, but, but 
um, here's some examples of some other bike trails in the neighborhood and, and uh, some of the studies we've been working on. Um, now, we've been thinking, just this, this is fresh off the press, nobody has seen this image before, uh, thinking pie in the sky, working with the University of Tulsa uh, and their architects of what we could do to really change the, the feel of the Gilcrease Museum, the look of the Gilcrease Museum. This is um, bumping out the front entrance, making it multi-story, and the idea is you can see Tulsa from the Gilcrease Museum, but you can't really see the Gilcrease Museum from Tulsa. So the idea is to raise the level of the Gilcrease Museum so there's a sight line. And I think psychologically, it will show that the Gilcrease isn't really that far away. It's not out of sight and out of mind, it's right there. And so uh, we're thinking about ways um, uh, to, to increase that, that profile. But also, um, uh, moving the restaurant from where it's at, there's a great view of the Osage Hills in the cafe at the museum right now, but moving that to the front of the building with a new gift shop, uh, new exhibition space, and so forth, but having it up on an on a upper level so that you would have literally 360 degree view of the surrounding area, downtown and the beautiful Osage Hills. Um, here's an example of what a new lobby might look like with a new gift shop, uh, uh, changing gallery space, and having a great event space. Right? The maximum amount of people we can get into one room right now um, for a standing event is about 400 people and only about 220 people seated. So we would love to have a space for five, six, seven hundred people at the Gilcrease Museum for corporate events, for museum events, and so on. Um, here's, here's a view of what that cafe looks like, and you can see downtown Tulsa out one window, and out the back window you would see the Osage Hills. So these are some ideas that we're kicking around right now. Uh, again, uh, working with the landscape, trying to create uh, uh, or extend the park, having that bike trail come to the Gilcrease Museum, and then uh, adding more square footage and, and building up on the Gilcrease Museum so that people can see it. And even if you drive up Gilcrease Museum Road now with all the trees and foliage, you can't really see the museum until you drive up on it. Um, and just quickly, I want to go through the exhibition schedule uh, that we, exhibits that we've got coming up. Right now, we have Rendezvous, uh, a couple artists represented, Walter Mattia and Andy Thomas. We had a great Rendezvous sale. This is an art sale. And the, the first night alone, uh, uh, Andy Thomas was the happiest artist in the world because we sold over $400,000 worth of his paintings that first night. And uh, he was very ecstatic about that. Um, right now, we have a great exhibit called California Impressionism. It's from the Irvine Museum in California. For the 4th of July weekend, we will have the original signed um, copy of the Declaration of Independence on display. I encourage you to come see that. We've got a great photo exhibit on Jazz, 52nd Street, coming. Uh, and then some other exhibits coming down the pike, Painted Journeys, The Art of John McStanley, which just opened in Cody, Wyoming at the Buffalo Bill Historical Center, um, and then we've got some other events um, later in the fall. So this, this is uh, a shot of the current exhibit, California Impressionism, and here's the Declaration of Independence, which will be on display for the 4th of July weekend. And I, I'm, I'm amazed at what, what the Gilcrease has in its archive. It's, it's pretty stunning. Uh, here's the jazz exhibit that's coming up. And I'm just flipping through here because I want to have time to answer some questions that you might have. Here's John Mick Stanley. This is the uh, this is Oregon City, Oregon, kind of the end of the Oregon Trail. Um, some of his historic paintings there. Anyway, again, we we do display some of the finest artwork in the country and the world, but we only want to get better at it. And I'm stopping right here because uh, I mentioned my native heritage. Uh, it's very important to me. This is my great-grandfather right here, the first James Pepper. And, um, and in my family, we continue our traditions. And uh, this month, I know the Osages are having their dances uh, up in Osage County. And uh, here's yours truly. And so I'm a, I'm a traditional dancer. And uh, we have our dances coming up in a couple weeks. And Ka is short for Kanza or Kanza. And the state of Kansas gets its name. Actually. Um, uh, I, I say the state of Kansas um, uh, drives its name from the tribe, but I like to think we gave the name to Kansas. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, so on, you might catch me at a powwow here and there uh, around Tulsa and around Oklahoma from time to time. But anyway, uh, that's a little bit about myself. But I wanted to give an opportunity 
to answer some questions because we, we're at a threshold moment here for the Gilcrease Museum. Um, there are three main things that we're, we're looking at right now. One is uh, working on a strategic plan for the operations of the museum, um, bringing in world-class exhibits, thinking about our space, how it can be, uh, the visitor experience can be much better at the Gilcrease, thinking about the grounds, but also the university is helping us build our endowment. We don't have much of an endowment right now, and we're going to increase our endowment hopefully by $60 million over the next decade. And then looking at the expansion of the Gilcrease Museum, and there is an opportunity this fall with some of the millage, some of the sales tax dollars, I think that were part of the 2025 initiative, that some of those dollars could come the Gilcrease way, because the Gilcrease, Tulsa's most valuable asset, deserves a world-class venue to showcase the collection, and we're not there yet, and it's gonna take a little bit of an effort to get there. So we're, we're planning, and we're, we're hoping that by the end of the summer, we'll have some better renderings of what the Gilcrease might look like, uh, working with the people of Tulsa to build and expand um, the Gilcrease Museum, so it is a world-class facility. So anyway, um, I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, we'll start with you, and then we'll... Beverly, sure. Downtown, I've mentioned this before, I mentioned it to Wayne, but now you're the executive director, I'll tell you. <laughs> at the downtown Gazero Center, why, what is the situation with putting the Gilcrease signs up? Well, uh, so the question is, how come we don't have a Gilcrease sign on the Zero Center uh, like the Philbrook has? Well, I just found out that the Philbrook is actually violating code by having that sign. <laughs> and, and they're gonna to have to take their sign down. So, uh, so, so all of us along the, the AHA Center, the Woody Guthrie, all of us are gonna to have to, because of the codes for that particular building, the, the signs may have to be redesigned. But um, I'm not sure what we can do yet with it. I'm, I'm just trying to go through all the regs right now and figure it out myself. If you can figure it out for me, I'd be, I'd be you know, my, takes a couple a couple lawyers wrote it's going to take a couple lawyers to figure it out I think but um, but anyway uh, but but you but really to answer the the real question is we we do want to have a presence downtown and I showed you I talked about that Indian art market at at the herd and there is an opportunity to do something on Guthrie Green maybe bringing a native art market to the Brady District with a Gilcrease brand on it because we have so many wonderful artists, but they're, go they're leaving Oklahoma because there's no, there's no venue or no uh, great opportunity for our native artists and other artists for that matter to showcase their work. So I'd love for Tulsa to have the reputation where people would come from the outside to come to Tulsa to see some of the finest artwork. And so that's one way we can, we can do something in the Brady District is have an arts festival. Yeah, um, I, I guess the, eventually the answer is yes, because we're, we're just getting started on this. And I can't remember the gentleman's name at the, at the university. Uh, who He also designed Crystal Bridges, uh, the gardens there. And we've talked with them. And um, there's a lot of synergy between the Gilcrease and Crystal Bridges. I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's in Bentonville, Arkansas. It's an incredible museum. Of course, they don't have the collection that the Gilcrease has. <laughs> but they have, they have the world-class venue. They do. And... Uh, and Alice Walton, as a young girl, would come from Bentonville to Tulsa because at that time they didn't have the department stores and so forth. And she recalls as a, as a young woman coming to the Gilcrease Museum and being inspired by the Gilcrease Museum. And that was her inspiration to build Crystal Bridges was the Gilcrease Museum and the gardens and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of people fly into Tulsa to go to Crystal Bridges. And I'd love to work with the tourism uh, group, the CVB here, uh, Visit Tulsa and to make sure that the Philbrook and the, I'll get to play nice with the neighbors, make sure the Philbrook and the Gilcrease are on, on the docket uh, as people go to Crystal Bridges. So uh, working with that group, but I think there's a lot of opportunity there. There's a question over here. So the question is, uh, how can folks help the Gilcrease besides opening up their wallets and donating? That always helps, though. And, uh, but I think, really, um, I would love to see an increase in local 
folks coming to the Gilcrease Museum. We're known nationally and internationally, but we don't have a lot of visitation with local folks outside of school groups. And so getting the word out, being an ambassador for the Gilcrease Museum, I know there are some of you in this room um, that have been on the Gilcrease board in the past and, and have supported the Gilcrease Museum. Um, and there'll be a time when we'll need your help too as citizens if we have to pass the bond uh, initiative or uh, lobby for, for taxpayer dollars to expand and improve the Gilcrease Museum. We're going to need your help there too as well. But, um, you know, again, I, I, I don't want to see the Gilcrease left in the dust with all the other things that are happening uh, in Tulsa with, you know, the Brady Arts District, the Gathering Place, the two new museums that are going to be built here in the next few years, that we need to have synergy and uh, with the Gilcrease Museum. There's a question here. Yes, um, we, we talked about this. In fact, I just came back from Corning, New York, from the Robert Rockwell, not the Norman Rockwell Museum, but the Robert Rockwell Museum in Corning. And Corning, as you know, is a big glass uh, producing town. And I met with other museum directors uh, from, for example, Amon Carter Museum in, in Fort Worth, uh, Stark Museum also in Texas, the um, uh, Buffalo Bill Historical Society and Cody. A lot of these Western art museums, we all came together. And between us all, there, there's nothing, I mean, already the Gilcrease is kind of the 800 pound gorilla in terms of its collection. We've got more Remingtons and Russells at the Gilcrease than any other museum in the world combined. And so all these Western art museums are very jealous of the Gilcrease, but they have some beautiful pieces as well. And we talked about developing traveling exhibits that will not just go through the United States, but throughout the world. And Gilcrease experimented with that a few years ago by sending an, an exhibit to Italy, and it was very well received. But our biggest market right now, believe it or not, is China. And the Chinese are very, very interested in American culture, American art, and Western, the idea of, of the West, the American West. And so I think if we pull our resources together within this consortium, we can put together a fantastic traveling exhibit that's co-branded with the Gilcrease and travel that around the world, and that would certainly increase our profile for the Gilcrease Museum. And so that's one of the things that we're doing. We're also digitizing our collections. Um, you know, we've got hundreds of thousands of items, and we're starting out with about the first 100,000 items or so. Getting those digitized in high quality and getting it online with the catalog information, and, and we've been working on that for a little over a year now. We'll continue for the next several years, but the idea is to get uh, some of the, the, the more well-known pieces up online, and that would have an impact uh, around the world as well. Any other questions? How are we doing on time? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I could talk about the Gilcrease all day long, but, but hopefully, uh, at some day, I'll trade in my Anchorage Rotary badge for a Tulsa, downtown Tulsa badge, and I'll get to talk to you every week about it, so. Yeah. Thank you. Right, can I say thank you to, I, I wanna say uh, thank you to President Rhonda and, and, and David, and, uh, uh, I know, uh, and Bob, Bob said was uh, part of, in, in coup with other people in getting me here today, and I appreciate that. And I know Keith Bailey's not here today, but uh, he put the bug in President Upham's ear over at University of Tulsa to bring me in today, so I wanna thank all of them. Thank you. What an exciting vision. We're so glad that you decided to move back to Oklahoma. A book recognizing today's um, program will be presented to, I think it's Phil Brook or Crystal Bridges. Anyway, it's called <laughs> Touching Spirit Bear. Just kidding. It's going to sell you Clinton School. You guys are with it. Okay. June 17th, uh, we have a speaker, Ed Payton, Ce Celebrity Attractions. And then June 24th, the biggest day of the year. Come on. You're in review. As we conclude, enjoy one of my favorite songs. It's called Feeling Groovy. We are adjourned. Good morning, last just kicking down the cobblestones. Looking for fun and feeling groovy.